Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. My name is Amy Harris, and I'm the director of the University of Michigan Museum of Natural History. And today, we're very happy to share our 2021 Ferrand Memorial Lecture, which is titled COVID-19 Vaccines, Science Close to Home. This is our first ever virtual Ferrand Lecture. And while I wish we could be together, we have a fantastic turnout, and I'm so glad that you're all here. If you're from out of state, let us know in the chat. I'd like to begin our program by acknowledging that the University of Michigan is located on the territory of the Anishinaabe people. In 1817, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations made the largest single land transfer to the University of Michigan, seated in the treaty at the foot of the rapids. We acknowledge the history of native displacement that allowed the University of Michigan to be founded. Today, we reaffirm contemporary and ancestral Anishinaabek ties to the land and their profound contributions to this institution. I'd like to give you a quick update on the Museum of Natural History for people who are not familiar with the museum. After 90 years in the Ruthven Museums building, the museum moved next door into a brand new facility in the Biological Sciences building, a brand new biology research lab building, and opened in 2019. We were fully open for only four months before the pandemic caused us to shut down. Since then, we've been doing a lot of virtual programming, such as this uh, event, and providing a lot of content for a wide range of audiences. You can visit our website at ummnh.org to see the Museum at Home platform. We teach faculty, postdocs, graduate students, and undergraduate students science communication skills and then share out their work. It's a great way to learn about the latest in scientific research at the University of Michigan. We're currently open Friday and Sunday afternoons for the University of Michigan community only. You must be a current faculty, staff, or student with a valid M card. We're so sorry that we can't yet welcome children and families, but we're really looking forward to opening more widely as soon as it's safe to do so. And now I'd like to tell you briefly about the history of the Ferrand Memorial Lecture. The annual Ferrand Lecture was established in honor of William R. Ferrand, director of the University of Michigan Exhibit Museum of Natural History from 1993 to 2000. The William R. Ferrand Public Lecture Endowment was created to recognize his retirement. The lecture was renamed the William R. Ferrand Memorial Lecture following Bill's death in 2011. Now in its 21st year, Ferrand lectures have covered topics ranging from the challenges of sending humans to Mars to dinosaur eating snakes. I'd like to thank the many Ferrand Endowment donors. There are more than 60. This, the great thing about endowment gifts is that they are invested and we only spend a portion of the interest earned. This means that endowment gifts essentially last forever. This year marks the 21st annual Ferrand Lecture and we look forward to many more in the future. If you'd like to contribute, you can visit the giving page that we'll be providing as a link towards the end of the lecture. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's Ferrand Lecture, Chuck Wilson. Chuck Wilson is the Community Health Promotion Supervisor at the Washtenaw County Health Department. He has over 20 years of public health practice experience and has given hundreds of presentations to various groups in our county. Chuck received both his bachelor's and master's degrees from Eastern Michigan University and lives in Ypsilanti, Michigan with his family. Chuck, thank you so much for being here today. Good morning, everyone. And I'm very glad to be here today. Now, today's program features three panelists. Each speaker will talk for about 15 to 20 minutes and we'll hold questions until the end. Guests can put their questions in the chat as the presentations take place. Click on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen to open the chat box. In the view function in the upper right hand corner of your screen, you can select the way you want speakers to be displayed on your screen. Now, if time permits, we'd like to provide an opportunity for interaction. 
After the presentations, we'll send guests into small breakout groups for a few minutes with two questions to prompt discussion. When the, group, when the breakout groups end, everyone will come back together for Q&A with the panelists, and I'll be the moderator of that Q&A. Now, just a reminder, please remain muted except during, breakout, except during the breakout groups to prevent background noise. Now that we have the housekeeping items addressed, it is my pleasure to introduce this morning's distinguished panelists. Associate Professor Dr. Emily Martin is an infectious disease epidemiologist at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. She currently leads Centers for Disease Control and National Institutes of Health-Funded Studies of Influenza Vaccines in Ambulatory Care Settings, Hospitals, and Community, which now also include the coronavirus. During the pandemic, Dr. Martin has been using COVID-19 public health data to help inform mitigation and policy at the state and local levels. Nina Masters just completed her doctoral degree in epidemiology at the University of Michigan. She received her Master's of Public Health in Global Health Epidemiology from the University of Michigan and her bachelor's degree in chemistry and materials engineering at Princeton University. Her dissertation research focused on spatial transmission models of infectious diseases, the impact of clustered non-vaccination on outbreak risk, and the evolution of vaccine hesitancy. She is passionate about science communication and seeks to make epidemiologic research accessible to all. And finally, Tony Denton is Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the University of Michigan Health System. He received his bachelor's degree from Northwestern University, a master's degree in health services administration from the University of Michigan School of Public Health, and a law degree from the University of Detroit Mercy School of Law. Tony joined the University of Michigan in 1981 as an administrative fellow and has risen steadily through health system leadership. He serves as a board member for numerous professional and community organizations and is a passionate advocate for the American Heart Association, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, the Education Project for Homeless Youth, and Food Gatherers. Dr. Martin, you are our first speaker and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. All right, let me take one second so I can show you the um, slides that I brought. So uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be able to present as part of this lecture series. I have to say it's, it's, um, it's, it's hard to do better than dinosaur eating snakes. Um, but I will I'll bring you kind of the best of what I've got in terms of COVID vaccine information today. So I, you know, the discussion today is going to be around vaccines. And I wanted to start off the discussion today with um, a, a little um, a, a discussion and a, and, a, and a brief description of how vaccines work to kind of set us all at the same page. And so, you know, really what a vaccine is doing is it, it, um, it introduces virus proteins into the body um, in, in a way that the body can recognize it as if a virus itself was entering the body. Um, and for COVID-19, when we're talking about these proteins, we're really talking about what we call the S protein or these red dots on the surface of the, the virus particle. Those, and we call that the antigen, but those are the proteins that our body recognizes and then um, can re-recognize once you've had a vaccine in order to fight the, the entry of the, the virus into the body. These red proteins here, they stick to the surface of our cells and that's how the virus infects us and infects our cells. So if we can block that red surface, we can, can block it? the virus from entering the body. So um, here's a picture of what this looks like if a virion was in a body, these blue things are representing our antibodies. The antibodies are basically trained to recognize those red dots as I, as I mentioned, and it coats the virus so that the virus can no longer stick to the surface of the cell and enter the cell and infect the body. It's blocked by this coating of these, these antibodies that I've made blue in this picture. So when you're making a vaccine, the trick is to introduce that red protein into the body in a safe way so that the, uh, the antibodies can be made and produced by the body and ready to go, um, but without infecting a person. So right now what we're working with is called an mRNA vaccine. So if you have an opportunity to get vaccinated now, you'll be receiving an mRNA vaccine. 
And so I also wanted to give a brief description of what we mean when we say an mRNA vaccine and how that works to do that introduction of the red protein to make the, the antibody, um, the gear up the antibodies to protect people. So in the course of normal cell biology, mRNA is made by our cells in the nucleus and pushed out of the nucleus into the surrounding area of the cell. And it, it works as kind of an instruction template for the ribosome, which is kind of the protein production factory of the cell to make proteins that the body needs. Um, and it, it, it follows whatever instructions that are fed to it. And the MRA, mRNA is kind of the template um, to, to um, basically make the, the polypeptides or, or that become the proteins so that could show how the, those get made. When we're using an mRNA vaccine, we're basically not interacting with the nucleus of the cell at all. We're just introducing that instruction piece. So we're just introducing this mRNA piece that tells the protein factory of the body what to do next. So by introducing the right uh, piece of mRNA into a cell, what we can then do is initiate the ribosome's ability to produce a polypeptide that looks like those red proteins at the surface of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So basically our body is going to assemble the thing that we need to produce antibodies to without interacting with our cell's DNA or interacting with the, the nucleus of the cell, which is kind of the hub of, of our DNA. After it makes that, so then it releases into the body and we can initiate that vaccine protection process so that you can have antibodies that are developed and are trained now to recognize these proteins and see them again if the virus shows up to, to create an infection. So what happens after that protein gets formed is everything then dissolves, right? mRNA is actually an incredibly uh, it's not a very sturdy mo molecule. It, it really degrades very quickly. So after this protein has been made, the instructions, it's kind of like a self-destructive self, uh, self message. It just poof, uh, and they, they dissolve um, and break up into small pieces and eventually just completely go away. And so it doesn't maintain the instruction sheet in the body for a very long time. But we still have that immune memory that's been created because we made those antibodies. We know how to make them again if the virus comes around. So the mRNA vaccine, like I mentioned, is the one that's available now. Um, we have a lot of other ways of delivering vaccines um, and a lot of other strategies that we've used in the past. The mRNA strategy is the one that was available the fastest, but we have viral vector vaccines. Those are coming soon. Those vaccines are similar to, those are made the same way that the Ebola vaccine was just made a, a few years ago. If anybody heard about the really amazing success of the Ebola vaccine with those outbreaks. So the viral vector vaccines are coming next use um, that technology. And then there's also protein vaccines that don't deliver the instructions, but deliver that red protein itself to the body. And that's a strategy that we've used for a very long time for vaccines, but those ones are still in trials. So we have this, um, this interesting phenomenon right now. You know, I'm used to influenza vaccine where we get a new kind of influenza vaccine like every five years. We're getting new kinds coming onto the market all the time. Um, but you know, the viral vector vaccines, the protein vaccines are based on the technologies that we've already been used to using for quite some time. The next vaccine you're gonna be seeing come out is what's called the J&J &J vaccine or the, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. This one is a viral vector vaccine. So using the same technology as with Ebola. Um, the vaccine efficacy, um, there's a range of different studies coming up with different efficacies, but still quite high. Um, in the vaccinated groups, they're saying no hospitalizations or deaths among people who've been vaccinated. So um, great data in terms of how well it's working and excellent safety profile. Um, and it, the important thing to think about is this one is actually being tested as a one dose vaccine. And so being able to roll this out operationally means that you're getting more people covered in a community even faster compared to what we're able to do now with the two dose mRNA vaccines. And so um, really um, a lot of anticipation to see this get approved. I know that this is gonna be evaluated towards the end of February. 
So how do we know what we know about vaccines? And how, how do we, you know, the, the, I know there's a lot of talk about, well, these happen so fast. And really what, you know, what, what happened was, what we did is we took the normal vaccine process and we, we sort of took all of these stages that we usually do one right after another and stretch out over five years or eight years. And we did a lot of those steps at the same time. So the factories kind of got built and geared up the same time we were testing things in trials. Um, and we were able to compress the timeline, but, but each step used the same amount of data that you would normally use when you're approving a vaccine. So, um, you know, for the randomized trials, this is an example for the Pfizer mRNA vaccine. Um, they really came back with very compelling data very early on how well these vaccines work. And here's an example of what that data looks like. Now, the blue line with the boxes that goes on the diagonal, thing, that is the accumulation of infection events that happen in people that receive the placebo. The red line on the bottom with the circles, that's the accumulation of infection events in people that received the vaccine. Now, even by counting squares versus counting circles, you can see that there were so many more infections happening in the people that got the placebo compared to the people that got the vaccine and the trial. And that separation really begins to happen after about really a week and a half, two weeks after vac the vaccine began um, was administered to participants, we really start to see protection develop in, um, in the, the general group. So what happens next? It's one thing for a vaccine to work in a trial. It's another thing for a vaccine to work in the real world. And as um, my background as an influenza vaccine researcher, I know this very well. Sometimes the influenza vaccine works way better than others. And, and but the, the kind of the good news from my experience with flu vaccine is that we know how to do this. We know how to answer this question and monitor how well the vaccine is gonna work in the future. There um, on the left, I've got just sort of a, a cartoon about how, how we continue to monitor vaccines after they're released into the public. We basically look at um, uh, studies of people who are sick and go to the doctor with, uh, with a, um, in, uh, you know, symptoms that look like the infectious disease. We test them to see if they have flu or not, and now to see if they have COVID or not. And we ask them if they were vaccinated. And we can then apply some formulas to figure out what the real life vaccine effectiveness of these vaccines are going forward. And we can do it on a real time and rolling basis. So if things start to change, we can be able to see that change in terms of the vaccine effectiveness. On the right, um, we can, uh, you can see an example of how we've done that year after year with the flu vaccine and how we see that the flu vaccines kind of changed from year to year in terms of how effectiveness it is. Um, with that graph on the right, you know, and I'll show you an example of this later, I really want to under, um, kind of drive home the point that you know, the vaccines that we're working with now are coming out with an efficacy in the 90, 95% range. That is higher than our wildest dreams in the vaccine field. We were hoping to get something in the 60 to 70% range. And the reason we were looking for that is when you look at flu vaccine, we're used to things um, in the 50 to 60 to 70% range. And that means we're reducing illness by about 50%. And it's, it's saving a really high number of lives, preventing a high number of hospitalizations, even with these numbers. So you can imagine how impactful a vaccine that's working at the 70 or 90 or 95% range is gonna work. And um, you know, as I mentioned, we know we know how to do this going forward. Influenza taught us how to do this. It was, you know, it's a really fast changing virus. Influenza is, um, and we have to constantly work to monitor the strains and look for variants. And, and you've heard all of this with SARS-CoV-2 now, and then to reformulate the vaccine as we need to. And so those processes are already in place. One advantage that we have now is with the flu vaccine. Um, I like to describe this in terms of my daughter loves to play with Legos and, and if you build a Lego house, what happens if you build a Lego house and think of the vaccine as the house? For flu, if you build a Lego house and you don't like the color of the roof, you have to put the whole house aside and you have to build a whole house from the beginning. You have to start completely start over. And that's what we do the vaccine for flu every year. We completely start over. For SARS-CoV-2, 
with these mRNA vaccines, and one of the reasons people are excited about this technology is if you don't like the color of the roof, you take off the roof and put a new roof on. You, you don't have to start from scratch every time. And so that's an incredible advantage from what we've had before. So this is an example of um, what happened in the 2014-15 influenza season. And this is um, work that my group at the University of Michigan was involved in, is monitoring how the virus was changing throughout the country. These um, pie pieces that you see are different strains that were emerging throughout the influenza season. And we were seeing them and then planning how to adjust the vaccine next to respond to it. And the same thing is happening now with SARS-CoV-2 and all this discussion of variants. So variant development is expected, it's natural. It's happening with SARS-CoV-2 at about the same speed that we see it happening with, um, with uh, influenza. It goes about the same, it goes at, at about the same speed in general, especially for that red protein. That's what we're really concerned about. Now, we don't worry about all changes in the virus. We worry about changes in the virus if they change how the virus works and how it interacts with the body. And so the CDC is tracking this, and that's where you hear about, um, for instance, B117, which was the variant that became really common in the UK. And so far, it looks like these new variants that are being kind of classified by the CDC are being identified because they spread a bit faster. So, and we're still determining what that means for vaccines, what that means for severities, but it does look um, pretty solid in the data that they're spreading faster. So what does that mean for prevention? What does that mean for vaccines? When we think about, we know first, what does it mean to spread faster? Because SARS-CoV-2 has these super spreader patterns, it has these bursts where one person might infect one other person, but they might infect five people or six people. When you've got a variant, you may be infecting eight people or 10 people when you would have normally infected a smaller cluster. When you think about putting vaccine into this situation, however, um, it's really about blocking, if each transmission that you can block with the vaccine um, means you're not only preventing that person from beginning, becoming sick, but you're also preventing all of these clusters from getting sick. And so you've got this multiplier effect and how the vaccines can stop super spreaders and they can do that with the variants too. Now we're still learning a lot about how much transmission the vaccine is going to prevent. Um, that data is still coming in. It's looking optimistic that we're gonna be able to prevent even mild transmission um, in addition to preventing people with, um, with uh, more, um, more, severe or, uh, more severe cases or, or prevent hospitalization and death. So I wanted to um, kind of really emphasize this if issue about how effectiveness meets protection um, by looking at an example of, of all of these kind of blocks of, of example people I hear have in these stick figures. Um, now, 95% effectiveness all the way to the left, that's what I was talking about. Those are the kinds of numbers we're getting out of the clinical trials. 60% um, effectiveness all the way on the right, that's like a good influenza vaccine. Um, now, what we're hearing discussion about is, you know, the variant strains might mean that effectiveness falls maybe closer to the 75% range than the 95% range, or maybe closer to the 60% range. Now, if that ends up being true, what I've got in these blocks are all of the people that without a vaccine would have had mild, or I'm sorry, would have had moderate to severe illness. So these are people that would have been missing work, potentially hospitalized, potentially having mortality from the infection. Now the blue people are people that are not having that moderate to severe illness because they were vaccinated. Um, the effectiveness means that the amount of blue people versus green people in the graph gets smaller for each one, but it's still a lot of people. It still means that over half of the people that would have had severe or moderate illness or gone to the hospital or had mortality are no longer going to have that severe illness. Over half of them are going to be, pre um, going to be prevented from having that event. Um, compared to if they had not received the vaccine at all. So even if the vaccine effectiveness changes on this scale because of the variant, it's still preventing over half of the impact in, in the general population. So we still have more blue people, 
um, then we have green people, all of these blue people will have been protected because of the vaccine. So we all, when we think about vaccine effectiveness, and I think this will be kind of a good, a good liquor into what um, what uh, Nina Masters is going to talk about next. Um, we're not going to be able to vaccinate everybody, and right now we know for sure that we're not going to be able to vaccinate kids because we don't have a vaccine that's approved for children that are under 16. And um, but what we can do is protect them by having those X's to interrupt transmission by vaccinating everybody around them. Um, and so our goal is to vaccinate as many people as we can so we can be a cocoon and we can provide that protection, not just for ourselves, but for the people around us um, that for maybe they're young or for whatever reason aren't going to be vaccinated. So with that, I'm going to close my message there and turn it back over to Chuck. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Our next panelist will be Nina Masters. But before she begins, I want to remind you to put your questions in the chat box at any time. Nina, you have the floor. Thank you. Let's share this. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Emily, for that really great introduction on how vaccines work. I think that'll really go well with what I'm talking about today, which is COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy and looking at causes and consequences, as well as spatial clustering of non-vaccination. So a quick outline of what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna start with the basics about vaccine hesitancy, move into current trends that we're seeing with COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy, distinguish hesitancy from access related factors, then go into why disparities and clusters in vaccination matter, and hopefully end on a slightly hopeful note about what we can do about it moving forward. So starting off with the basics. So what is vaccine hesitancy? So the WHO actually defined hesitancy in 2011, and they defined it as a delay in the acceptance or refusal of vaccines despite the availability of vaccination services. And so a key part that I wanna focus on of this definition is that hesitancy is a continuum. It's specifically the space between those who are refusing vaccines but are unsure to those who accept vaccines um, but are unsure. So it's really about those people in the middle who are unsure. And this is in contrast to the often used delineation that we see in the media where you have kind of vaccinators and anti-vaxxers. So this is not really how the WHO defined vaccine hesitancy. So why are some reasons that people might be hesitant to vaccines? This is not an exhaustive list by any means, but I'm just going to go through five main categories. So the first is that vaccines are a victim of their own success. So as vaccine coverage increases, the diseases that they protect us from are gonna decrease in both incidence and prevalence. So as vaccines work and get rolled out, they're going to be less common and they're gonna seem like less of a risk. And this can actually make the vaccines seem less necessary because you're not seeing polio anymore every day. So you're not thinking necessarily, I need to go get a polio vaccine. However, it's actually the fact that the vaccines worked well that caused these diseases to be fading from view. So the second main concern here that is something that people really, I would say, is increasing alongside the decrease in the fear of vaccine preventable diseases is the inflated fear of adverse events from vaccines. And I want to distinguish this from the totally normal and understandable fear of needles and side effects. I think you'd be hard pressed to find someone who's not uncomfortable with needles, um, but the issue really happens where individuals don't see the diseases that vaccines protect you from, but you're worried about potential side effects. And when that fear outweighs the perceived benefit, that can become a real problem. So the third category here is infringement on personal liberty. Um, work from Saad Omer, who's one of the giants in the field of vaccine hesitancy research, has identified that people who really hold on to moral foundations of autonomy and liberty have much higher rates of vaccine hesitancy. And this just kind of goes along with the idea that you don't want someone to be telling you what to do with your medical decisions. Then another category we have here is mis and disinformation. So one of the biggest forces that's really fueling vaccine hesitancy, especially right now, is the role of misinformation that's easily circulating, especially on social media. 
just last week, actually, Facebook and Twitter announced that they're going to restrict vaccine misinformation on their sites. This is a wonderful move in the right direction. Um, but it might be a little on the too little too late side because it's hard to put that kind of once the cat's out of the bag, it's hard to retract that information. So I think we'll see what happens, but it's a step in the right direction. And then the last main category here is distrust of government and medical institutions. And this is particularly a concern among communities of color who have long faced discrimination and exclusion and unjust practices in medicine. And there remains a lot of racism and discrimination in everyday medical visits. So a lot of this distrust is warranted and it's gonna be really important and challenging to rebuild that trust moving forward. So what are we seeing with demographic trends in COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy? So this is data from the Kaiser Family Foundation, and this shows the prevalence of hesitancy in different demographic subgroups. And this is from a survey in January. So what you'll automatically and quickly notice is that there's a really big partisan divide. So Republicans who were surveyed had the highest rate of vaccine hesitancy, which was 30 percentage points higher than that of Democrats. And this is something that differs a lot from the research on vaccine hesitancy towards classic pediatric vaccines, where it doesn't really follow a clear partisan divide. That's kind of the first indication that vaccine hesitancy for COVID looks a little bit different. Um, then there's also this discrepancy um, between the hesitancy in black adults versus white adults, where black adults who were surveyed had higher hesitancy than white adults. And again, this is different than most of the literature that has come out around vaccine hesitancy for pediatric vaccines. And one of the reasons why this is likely to be going on is that this is data on the right here from the COVID Collaborative, which did a vaccine hesitancy survey in late 2020, and they found extremely low levels of trust, specifically by Black Americans who were surveyed in the government, in the FDA, in pharmaceutical companies, and this distrust, again, is really warranted. But these numbers are pretty shocking. They have found that only 14% of Black Americans trusted that a vaccine would be safe, and only 28% trusted that a vaccine would be tested for safety in Black populations. So again, this really reflects the systematic mistreatment and exclusion of these communities from scientific research. And I think this is a really important lesson that we as researchers need to think about moving forward about how to remedy this. So here I'm gonna present the vaccine hesitancy for the research kind of in the pre-COVID world. So pediatric vaccines and parents here are the decision makers. There are a lot of really important differences and this really touches on what Dr. Martin just said that what's so interesting about COVID is that people are making the decision to vaccinate themselves and it's an adult decision. There actually aren't vaccines approved for children whereas most of the literature that we have on vaccine hesitancy comes from the exact opposite scenario where you have information on vaccine hesitancy for parents who are choosing to vaccinate their children for mandatory vaccines. So it's not unsurprising that some of these factors might be different, but it's a little bit surprising maybe how different they are. So as I mentioned, not everyone who has access to a vaccine is going to get one. And that WHO definition actually delineates vaccine hesitancy from access because they define hesitancy as their refusal despite the availability of vaccination. So this automatically kind of creates these two groups where you have hesitant groups who are unvaccinated versus those who are unvaccinated due to low access. But in the literature around pediatric vaccines, there are actually some phenotypic differences between these groups. And so children of vaccine hesitant parents tend to be completely unvaccinated. So they often don't have any of their vaccines in the pediatric vaccine series. Whereas children of parents who lack access are often under vaccinated, which means they have some but not all of their pediatric vaccines. And these typically represent very different uh, sociodemographic groups. So the parents of unvaccinated children are often white, higher income, highly educated and privately insured. Whereas the parents of under vaccinated children are often black, lower income, lower education and publicly are uninsured. So again, this is looking really different from the slide I just showed you about COVID vaccine hesitancy. And I think a lot of this difference speaks to the fact that with COVID, um, the vaccine was developed in this highly politicized environment um, under the leadership of a government that was continually disappointing 
and disrespecting Black Americans. And this did not create an environment of trust. And that might be one reason why we're seeing a very different pattern. But unfortunately, there's been this confluence of access related factors on top of vaccine hesitancy that is leading to worsening COVID disparities with the vaccine rollout. And this is especially pronounced for communities of Black Americans in the United States. So racial data is not available in all states. It's currently only available in 23 states. This data from Kaiser shows data for 12 of those states. And what you'll see from this chart is pretty significant racial disparities. So you can see that the orange dots are those who are vaccinated and black in each state, which is lagging pretty far behind the share of state residents who are black. Those are the blue dots. And in most states, that's lagging even further behind the share of health workers who are black. And those are the gray dots. So to take an example in Maryland, 42% of the state's healthcare workers are black. Black people account for 30% of the state population, but only 16% of the vaccinations in the state. So beyond these demographic trends in vaccine uptake and vaccine hesitancy, I also want to note that there are important geographic differences just in terms of your access to the vaccine based on where you live. So if we look at healthcare availability, which is directly relevant because right now we're really relying on health systems to distribute the vaccines in the US, you can see that healthcare availability is not uniform across the United States. There's a lot more access to primary care in particular from this map in the Northeast along the West Coast and parts of the Midwest. And you can imagine that this is just one of many layers of access factors to the vaccine. And there will just be fundamental differences in your access depending on where you live. So this would just create kind of a fine scale patchwork of individuals access to the vaccine and likely individuals who are vaccinated across the US. And so this can ultimately predispose certain communities to being at higher risk of COVID infection because they weren't able to get the vaccine. So it's really important to identify these communities and the risks they face in terms of infection, but that's not gonna be possible unless we're really vigilant about collecting this fine scale data. And that's kind of where my research comes in here. So we are witnessing this fine scale patterning with respect to COVID, both in terms of infection and the first wave of infection, there was a lot of media coverage about how heterogeneous it was by race and by income. But also there's this unfortunate heterogeneity in access and in vaccine hesitancy. So you have these three different levels of factors that are kind of coming together to create these fine scale clusters of unvaccinated communities who are susceptible to more infection. And this is what my PhD research focused on, was this clustering of kind of vaccine hesitancy and coverage, but looking at measles, not COVID. And what I found was that when you have this clustering, you significantly increase outbreak risk. And you all might remember here in Michigan in 2019, there was a really large measles outbreak. It was actually the largest outbreak that Michigan has seen since 1991. And this outbreak primarily occurred in Oakland County, Michigan. So I'm just gonna quickly walk through an example of this clustering that was from Oakland County for the year that started this outbreak. And this is for kindergarten vaccine exemption data in the county. So you can see at the county level, overall, pediatric vaccination rates were high. There were 7% of kindergartners who had a vaccine exemption who were unvaccinated. But as you move from right to left, you start to see that as you get to these finer scales, there's a lot of variability in vaccination coverage. At the school district level, this ranged from school districts where there were 0% kindergartners who had an exemption to 26%. And as you move all the way to the left at the block group level, there were actually some block groups where 50% of kindergartners had exemptions and were unvaccinated. So this just shows that there can be a lot of variability in these small community level vaccination rates. And that will be totally missed if you just kind of look at the zoomed out county level picture. And my dissertation research really showed that this fine scale patterning can allow these communities to have outbreaks that don't just occur in the communities but they can spread to their neighbors and to other communities. And so this happened in 2019 for measles. And I think we're kind of getting this lesson from the data coming out on COVID that this could certainly happen again for COVID-19 if we're not really vigilant about identifying these clusters of non-vaccination and trying to remedy them. So I think everyone's pretty convinced, um, at least if you're reading the news, that the way out of the pandemic is through herd immunity. But as Emily mentioned, there are already 
some threats to herd immunity that we're facing. So there's the evolution of new variants, there's high required vaccination coverage, unknowns about duration of protection, and then we also have vaccine hesitancy. And perhaps the one thing that we can do the most about to arm ourselves best to actually reach herd immunity is to reduce vaccine hesitancy. And in 2019, the WHO actually listed hesitancy to be one of the top 10 threats to global health. This was kind of a prescient move. I think that this has definitely increased as a threat to global health since they made that choice. But I do think that if we don't address this persistent vaccine hesitancy, particularly among these insular communities that are highly clustered, that conquering COVID through herd immunity is gonna be a real challenge. Just because a lot of research, including what I've spent the last five years doing, has really shown that herd immunity needs to be maintained at these finer scales in order to actually eliminate the disease and stop the spread. So I'm gonna try to end on a slightly optimistic note here. Um, it's not all bad news. There are options for moving forward to combat vaccine hesitancy. I do wanna underscore these are not overnight solutions. These are probably on the order of years or decades, but the government has a big role to play here, targeting unvaccinated or undervaccinated children and first and foremost, improving access to vaccination services. But I also think the government really has to step up and increase their regulation of misinformation. And while it's wonderful that Facebook last week took down all the misinformation on their site, this would have been a really helpful move a year ago. We as researchers also have a piece of the pie here. We have, I think, a responsibility to increase knowledge about vaccination, to identify evidence-based solutions, to try to combat rising vaccine hesitancy. And then my personal passion project is to push for finer scale data. So we can find these communities that are unvaccinated, find these communities with high rates of vaccine hesitancy, and make sure that they don't get left behind at increased risk of disease. Healthcare providers have an incredibly important role. A lot of surveys recently have shown that most Americans trust their healthcare provider more than any other source for information on the vaccine. So providers have a big responsibility to show confidence in vaccines through their language, through their action, through modeling behavior. They also can increase knowledge about vaccination with their patients. And it's important to have empathy and avoid further polarization on this issue of vaccine hesitancy. And then finally, within our community, it's important to target local community and healthcare workers, engage religious and community leaders, and understand historical barriers to trust. All of these ingredients are gonna be necessary to kind of rebuild trust in government, trust in institutions, and trust in vaccinations. And I think that's really the best way forward towards trying to move out of this pandemic. So that is it, and thank you. Thank you, Nina. Our final speaker, Tony Denton, will wrap up the presentation portion of today's program. Now remember, submit your questions. We've been getting some great questions in the chat feature, so keep them coming. Tony, you have the floor. Thank you, Chuck. I will share my screen. Um, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I always learn so much um, from these conversations, and you've received a wealth of information uh, from both uh, Emily and Nina uh, about the science and some of the behavioral indicators related to uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Um, my part in this presentation is to talk about how do we engage the community? How do we get closer to home to help inform uh, what is happening and how you as individuals or as family members uh, make decisions that are life-saving decisions. Uh, home for me is here in Ann Arbor with my family, Chicago with my extended family and a, a 90 year old mother who uh, has underlying uh, conditions and figuring out ways to get her vaccinated in a, in a safe way. So we wanna uh, kind of break this information down and talk about what we're doing at Michigan Medicine to try to engage the community uh, to inform on the science that's been shared today and to help people make decisions that are meaningful uh, to them that help to address this pandemic. As a leader at Michigan Medicine, one of the important points for us is to establish principles, principles for how we would engage the community that really is foundational to our efforts around diversity, 
equity and inclusion. Uh, and so it's not something that we just created, but really it's something that helps to shape how we would approach any issue that's affecting the community. So it's really establishing a sense of community. And you'll hear me talk a lot about team, teamwork, and community certainly is reflective of the teamwork across various levels where we're trying to engage in the important conversations to align the resources in an efficient manner so that we aren't duplicating effort, but to uh, collaborate and partner together. Uh, examples which include relationships with St. Joe Mercy Health System, Washtenaw County Health Department, and others that I'll mention later. But all of those shape partnerships where we're trying to increase our resolve. One team, one goal, reduce death and illness associated with this, uh, with this disease. Collaborating across community to improve inclusivity uh, includes equitable access to healthcare, diagnosis, treatment, and recovery. We stay connected with the state guidelines to ensure that we are following uh, a process that is helpful in terms of how we organize our work and our efforts, uh, but also to create transparency, uh, which is an important goal, but a mighty challenge as well, because the target moves. But regardless of how the target is moving, we have to be intentional about what we say and to commit to what we can do and the pace within which we can do it. Clearly the goal is shots in arms, or to vaccinate as many people as possible in a safe manner. So for some time now, we have been engaged around uh, various access strategies to uh, create a framework that includes uh, dialogue and planning with other university mission stakeholders to inform, develop, and engage the community around a plan that provides ac equitable access to COVID-19 vaccine. So we are always talking and figuring out how to do this better. Crafting this alliance with St. Joe Mercy Health System in Washtenaw County, I believe is the foundation for how we create a coordinated approach, particularly as the winds change from day to day about the availability of supply. And we have to stay connected in a way so that we are not over promising and under delivering but managing in an open, honest, and, and candid way what we can do and when we can do it. And I think that means trust. How we improve trust in the vaccine uh, process. You've heard a lot from Nina uh, about the issues and the challenges of hesitancy and, and maybe even uh, some apathy. And our goal is to create the meaningful opportunities uh, for engagement, particularly around communities of color to support informed decision-making. We know that there are social determinants of health that are uh, prevalent uh, regardless of the health uh, situation, but certainly as we think about transportation and access to technology, um, computer, Wi-Fi, we have to figure out how to reduce those gaps in a way that information transmission is meaningful and effective. Our connections with the state um, I am on um, the board for the Michigan Health, Health Association um, is huge. Our ability to understand the information from those that are responsible for guiding this process so that we can communicate to the communities in a way that's uh, consistent and respectful, effective and deliberate. But it's important that we have the information in order to be able to manage the expectations of the community uh, as well as with each other. And I cannot overemphasize that as we go through this process, which is very humbling, uh, we have to be mindful to over communicate, uh, communicate that which we have, but never keep our eye off the ball of communicating um, because it's very clear. There's so many concerns, so many worries. People need information, um, good information to reflect upon. Uh, Nina's uh, presentation regarding misinformation and disinformation, how we filter information in a way so that it's, it's honest and open, it may not be what people want to hear, but it's important that people hear uh, the truth. Um, that becomes really important for us to have an effective process that reinforces trust. So as we think about, okay, we're bringing science close to home. What does success look and feel like? Um, 
once again, you know, provides information about uh, how effective are we at penetrating the populations of risk uh, at risk. So we have a few measures here that we suggest are, uh, are important. Percentage of vaccinations of people of color among patients in service areas compared to national state benchmarks um, to measure those vaccination rates in a county relative to percentage who reside within the county. But the obvious goal, we wanna reduce disparities um, to ensure equitable access. I think success looks like a collaborative model within the university, outside the university, with visible levels of engagement across all communities of interest, which takes time and effort to inspire uh, discovery of, of the facts, the science, in order to inform decision-making. Once again, a team approach. The environment of trust, as we have had several webinars already, they've been modeled around listening, listening with intent, to acknowledge concerns and worries related to hesitancy or apathy, to provide science, uh, to inform and educate, all with the idea of that leading to action. And from a state perspective, in terms of the distribution of vaccine doses, is 90% of doses received that are administered within seven days, or 95% of people obtain their second dose within expected time frame, whether it be 21 days or 28 days, um, or whatever is prescribed um, by the manufacturers of the, of the vaccine. At the end of the day though, success looks like a reduction, a reduction in deaths and severe illness associated with COVID-19. So that visual that uh, Emily Martin presented that shows the effect of the vaccine really is the true test, uh, but that's what we want to have as the result. We want to keep people here. Now, establishing pathways for access uh, through our community health services group within Michigan Medicine, in partnership with other providers and the county, uh, we're providing uh, programs that select Michigan Medicine sites within the city of Ann Arbor, as well as outside. And the pudding here though, is a local model uh, for vaccination sites in partnership with church, civic or other nonprofit groups. And that's taking the vaccine to the people in order to try to reduce those social determinants they may have an effect, a negative effect on uh, populations at risk, people of color not being able to get the vaccine that they need and deserve. Examples include the implementation of a mobile vaccine program or creating a pop-up vaccination clinic in the community, all of which are important options that we have uh, implemented in the past that we are looking at seriously now, uh, obviously pending the availability of the vaccine. As you may have heard or read, um, local pharmacies are now receiving vaccine uh, in the community to try to address bringing the vaccine to the community. I receive emails quite a bit from um, folks in the community asking questions about when do I get mine? What's the status? I received a positive email this morning of a friend who's older than 65 indicating that he was able to connect with Rite Aid and get registered and now has had his first vaccine. So you can feel that the process is starting to work better as more vaccine comes into the community. We have to develop registration systems though for easy sign up for individuals that don't rely upon or have computer or Wi-Fi access. And as was also mentioned earlier, our flu vaccine clinics and that whole process, uh, we've learned and we're building upon that learning to apply it to COVID vaccination models as well. Now with regards to communication, which I will continue to emphasize because we hear from various groups um, that say, we don't know, uh, we want to know. What can you tell us? When can you tell us? Because we uh, are very interested in getting vaccinated. So as we understand how we want to influence those who may be hesitant, there's a huge population of those that are in demand, such that demand now is clearly greater than supply. So our communication has to be clear, consistent, concise, and of course, complete. What we have engaged in in the month of January that's continuing uh, into February is we've had various webinars, town halls, 
to try to address uh, issues and questions related to vaccine hesitancy. Um, January 13th webinar within Michigan Medicine at a grand rounds. Uh, the 16th of January, COVID-19 in the African-American community, 100 people in attendance. And as we measure the impact of that engagement, you can see some of what people said coming out of it in terms of gaining new information to help make a decision. We're able to use the information in the future as they consider making a decision. But more importantly, that the most important questions were answered. And that to me is a marker of success that the conversations are the right conversations, the content is appropriate, and we're creating greater awareness so that people can make decisions that we hope lead to getting vaccinated. A statewide Q&A regarding COVID vaccine on the 25th, where there were 300 in attendance, um, once again, a collaborative aimed at trying to address the questions that people have in order to engage and create that awareness. Now, for Michigan Medicine, uh, we want to clearly lead, but we also want to lead in collaboration with others to be a source of reliable information. And that can only be uh, a fact based on having good partnership. So connecting with other providers in the community and learning, learning real time of what the concerns and fears and anxieties are. Uh, I believe that's the model for success and being engaged in a way that we know what we can do, we communicate what we will do in order to improve trust. Then you see several quotes there, uh, people that attended various sessions and how they um, feel about it. I would uh, comment that the earlier topic of whether the vaccination process was too fast is a uh, question that's repeated often. And I think Emily did a great job of explaining uh, how the vaccination process uh, is still the norm, but we're finding new ways to do things better. And sometimes we uh, forget that we can do things better. And uh, I've been vaccinated. I trust the process. I believe it's safe. I think anybody that has a concern about it, uh, please find out what you need to know, but let it lead to individual decisions for you that helps to keep you and others safe, as well as your family members, that we need to keep you here. Other accomplishments for Michigan Medicine, I will list one in particular, because it's all about collaboration, uh, but the, the various, various alliances with the community, including the Ministry of Alliance of Ypsilanti, Ann Arbor, and the surrounding areas, and the other local uh, civic organizations or educational organizations, be it Messiah's Temple, Washington Community College. We believe that that is so significant to our success. If we want to cascade information, we want to empower through information, educate to elevate, and to create the awareness necessary to keep everyone safe and here. Now, having said all that, there are challenges. The vaccine distribution and the demand is greater than the supply. We were in active conversations with the state and at a local level to continue to identify uh, how we will get more vaccine in order to deliver it to the population, deliver it to people of color um, and all others who are at risk. Now, there are dynamic changes in planning, as you know, as you read it, and which keeps us hopping and moving to try to figure out how to adjust. Uh, there is fatigue in our workforce. It's been you know, 11 months now of dealing with pandemic of one type or another, whether it be the public health pandemic or the economic freefall that results from that, unemployment, food insecurity, and folks are tired. But we have to continue to focus on there being a light that helps to address uh, and create an optimism that uh, we can do this. Vaccine hesitancy and apathy, Nina spoke to that. Managing expectation at all levels and transparency. Um, while I identify those as areas of our, our attention, there are ongoing challenges because people continue to have questions. But seeing and sharing optimism, while it's a challenge, it's also the countermeasure. We wanna create the optimism. We can show success because we can get through this together. And then of course, after all is said and done, trust creating trust, 
sustaining trust uh, is an ongoing challenge until we get through this. How can you help? Um, share the science. The, the facts are so important. Um, create the opportunities for further engagement like this experience we are sharing together today. I think though that listening is important. Acknowledgement in order to guide toward informational resources so people have the data that they need to help inform them to make decisions. Advocate for the vaccine now. Prepare for it when it is available. Uh, there's a train coming and it's a good train. Explain why vaccination is important to you because as an individual, you have to make that decision. But we hope that you do it in a way that uh, role models for others, for community. And I'll always say, communicate, communicate, communicate. Keep the lines of conversation open. There's, uh, there's no dumb question. They're all smart questions because uh, we are a community that needs to help each other. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And that wraps up the presentation portion of today's program. I'd like to thank our three speakers for their presentations and for setting the stage to begin our breakout group session. So before we begin that session, I'd like to reinforce a topic that both Nina and Tony touched on during their presentations, which is that there are people even here locally in our county who live in zip codes where positive COVID-19 cases are double the county average, such as on the eastern part of the county in it zip codes 48197 and 48198. And in these communities, there are high concentrations of African-Americans and also undocumented residents. And quite frankly, and I think this has been emphasized throughout the presentations that the limited amount of vaccine has worsened the pandemic in these communities. And something that both Nina and Tony talked explicitly about is the fact that due to the history of distrust of the medical system among people of color, there's this dilemma that we've noticed here locally in Washtenaw County, and I'm sure exists across, across the state and across the entire country. And that's that you have the desire for people of color to have increased access or more access to the vaccine versus vaccine hesitancy. So we ask that you keep these things in mind as you discuss the questions during the breakout session today. So welcome back everyone. I hope you all had a great conversation or had great conversations during the breakout sessions. We're going to move directly into our Q&A and I wanna start off with one of the first questions that was asked and that is how long is the vaccine affected and will you need to be vaccinated every year like the flu vaccine? I can start that one. So, uh, you know, the the vaccine, we've we've watched the effectiveness now for about two months, three months. We're getting on four months data from some of these trials. And so we're seeing good effectiveness out. But the reality is, you know, we don't even have a lot of people that have been infected for a full year, much less vaccinated. And so that's where these vaccine effectiveness monitoring programs are going to be really important to understand whether um, whether in a year from now, everybody's gonna need a booster. Um, that being said, we do see great data that the protection from the vaccine does seem to be even better than the protection that you get from infection. And, and so we're doing better than nature at the moment. So we're hoping that protection is gonna last for quite some time. That's great news. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Uh, the next question is, what does it mean if a person doesn't have a reaction to the flu besides pain, excuse me, to the vaccine besides pain in their arm? Is it still working? Should they be concerned? I think everybody reacts differently. You know, you know the, the, the data around adverse events from the trials really show that most people don't have a reaction. I know there's been a lot of conversation because a lot of people are reporting when they do have a reaction. Um, when, uh, when I get the flu vaccine, I get tired for a day. You know, it's, it's, so you have a whole big variation in, in how people react to, to vaccines with that initial, those initial side effects. So I wouldn't take the lack of side effects as a reason that it's not working. But if you do have side effects, that's where they're coming from. They're coming from the, all, all the work that your body does when it's mounting an immune response. Um, but the, I wouldn't assume that the opposite is true, that if you don't have side effects, that you're not having an effective response. Thank you. The, the next question is one that I'm starting to get as I work the vaccine clinics through the health department. 
And that's that um, should, should we wait for the adjusted vaccine batch since this is since there's no new data on what happens years down the road? Uh, for instance, is there a possibility of cancer? Just as an example. I can start, but then I'm interested in um, Dr. Denton's view as well, because he's doing a lot of the vaccine rollout. But, you know, with um, with these these vaccines, because they're they're introducing a protein that you're making antibodies to, we don't expect that the long term effects are going to be any different than any of the other vaccines that we have. Um, and actually, mRNA as a technology for therapy and for vaccine is not is actually not completely new. Um, we've seen it um, trialed a lot for right? we, um, influenza vaccine had been pursued already um, for a cancer therapy. mRNA has been pursued for a while. So we actually know a lot about its impacts on the body and there are no long-term concerns based on how we know it works in the cell. Uh, Tony, would you like to, to add anything to that or? Um, I appreciate Emily's terping, but I, I am not knowledgeable enough to be able to respond to that to that question. Gotcha. And this next question, I think, is is a, a practical question that we're receiving at the health department as it impacts families and individuals. Are patients able to have the surgical procedures they need before the pandemic, are they, or are they able to opt out, or will it be mandatory? Will it being the vaccine be mandatory before surgery? I'm not sure who wants to take that one. Could you repeat that question, Chuck? Yes, sir. Are patients able to have the surgical procedures they needed before the pandemic? Or will they be, will the vaccine be mandatory before they have that surgery? Well, currently uh, the vaccine is, is not mandatory. Uh, so I don't see that, that changing uh, down the road. Uh, patients are tested for presence of COVID-19 in order to ensure safety for a patient and providers. So there is a distinction there between testing that maybe is required versus the vaccine. Okay. I think that's a good segue to, to this question that I'm looking at in the chat. And that's that, what about underlying health problems? Heart, lungs, blood pressure, what's the, what's the protocol uh, as it relates to the vaccine for those with those pre-existing conditions? Yeah, you know, the way the trials were conducted, they had very broad inclusion. So there were a lot of people included in these trials. They weren't picking just kind of young, healthy people for the phase three trials. And so we do have experience with vaccinating people from a lot of different health backgrounds. When you go to get a vaccine, you know, you can always talk to your, your doctor to make that decision, but also you um, have your health in your vaccination history evaluated by a healthcare professional in the vaccination room before they deliver it. So you have an opportunity to review any health conditions you have and make sure that none of them are on the list that they're watching for, for a potential side effect. And so that's, that's a really kind of um, intentional and thorough process that happens at the point of vaccination that we use to make sure that people are comfortable coming in. Thank you. So I'm gonna sort of switch to the disparity questions uh, that were asked as a result of uh, remarks uh, made by uh, both Nina and Tony. In light of the fact that there are racial gaps in general uh, in terms of life expectancy, is there any consideration of lowering the age of eligibility for the vaccination of black and native American people? Um, I've not been engaged in any conversation uh, or I'm aware of the state's guidelines with regards to making those adjustments. The, the focus is on trying to bring vaccine to the populations at risk as quickly as possible. There is a social vulnerability index, which is intended to identify uh, the populations and the, the geography in order to accomplish that goal. So I think that's the pathway to accelerating vaccine to communities of color that would be at risk. 
Thank you. Next, Nick, the next question is, if people tend to trust healthcare providers, why hasn't the federal government, or excuse me, the federal program recognized that and rolled out the vaccine through these existing channels and mandated, and mandated them, them being the provider to extend beyond their current patients to increase access to the underserved populations? That's a great question. Um, don't have the answer to it. I can tell you though that uh, the frustration around our ability to make a meaningful impact is all tied to the actual supply of vaccine. Uh, we are geared up and prepared in terms of human capacity uh, to administer vaccine. Uh, we obviously got a slow start from one administration to the other uh, at the national level in terms of having a vaccination administration plan upon the production of the vaccine. And there are adjustments that are being made even as we speak to improve the production in order to get the vaccine to the states in order to get shots into arms. So I think that, as I mentioned earlier about the, um, the pharmacies and it's starting off with 6,500 pharmacies that will then expand to 40,000 pharmacies that will have access to vaccine that the process and the administration is going to accelerate uh, fairly rapidly. And that includes recent agreements that um, the Biden administration has reached to uh, have 200 million doses of vaccine uh, produced. Thank you. And here's a question that's a little bit more, well, it's local in terms of the state, uh, some of their, their uh, decision-making. Why did the state start with a broad base of people who are eligible? 65 plus makes no sense when we could have started with 80 plus and gone down by a five year, by five year ranges as doses became available. So in other words, why did we start um, with, a, with such a broad base when we could have been a little bit more targeted regarding the um, ages that were now vaccinated, age ranges rather? Um. I want to give Nina an opportunity to respond if she if she wants. Otherwise, I will dive in. I can start. Thanks for kind of a broad, non-programmatic answer to that. I think that um, there are lots of different factors that influence how likely the vaccine is to be effective. As Emily showed from those slides, the vaccines definitely can prevent severe infection, hospitalization, and death, but we don't have all the answers yet on how much they prevent transmission. And a lot of the questions about the optimal vaccine rollout strategy have to do with how much they prevent transmission and how much you want to be vaccinating individuals with the most contact versus individuals with the greatest risk of severe events. So I think that there's no perfect solution to you know, setting a, a guideline for eligibility, but I think the broader age cutoff was such that the only axis of eligibility wasn't determined by age, um, which would have come with its own criticism. But that's just my take as a non-practitioner. <laughs> so I'm curious what you think, Tony. Uh, I, I think that um, for so much of this pandemic, as a nation, we've been flying the plane while we're building it. We, we just did not know. We expected more supply to line up with a broader population to start. And we've been making adjustments as an industry ever since because we're trying to catch up to, to the supply. Um, and as you probably have noted, the age ranges have actually gone up or down 65 and up then to 75 and up and uh, trying to adjust uh, to the supply that's available. Uh, but suffice to say, um, while trying to stratify by risk categories, uh, we are behind and the point right now is that we have to catch up and, and to do that as fast as we can. And now there is more focus on the more severe at risk populations um, as a result. So I'm gonna remain optimistic uh, that with increased supply that uh, the overall goal of getting shots in arms uh, is soon upon us. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Tony. And I'd like to, before I turn it back over to Amy, I'd like to ask this, this $64 million question. And I think everyone, if they haven't asked, they're certainly thinking about it. 
Once fully vaccinated, is it safe to travel and visit family? I haven't hugged my children or grandchildren in 14 months. I can take that. So first I want to start with mentioning, you know, if that second dose, it takes, we think it takes about two to four weeks until your antibodies get to their maximum potential. Um, but at that point, you don't activate superpowers or anything, you know, and so, you know, in, in this conversation about um, risk and what situations you put yourself in, it definitely changes that conversation. That's a very personal conversation that people have with their families. Now, the data looks great that you're going to be highly, highly protected from moderate to severe illness, from hospitalization for death. And that's why people aren't hugging their children and their grandchildren, because their children and grandchildren want to protect them from having a, from, want to protect you from having a hospitalization, right? Now we still have a lot to learn about whether it's possible for you to get a mild illness or to have a transmission event in these mild levels. We're gonna to continue to learn more over that over the next few months, but I think it's okay to start making decisions where you've changed your calculation about what you do to protect yourself from hospitalization because now that protection is gonna be coming from the vaccine as well. And, but I do believe that this is a really personal conversation between people and their families. And whatever they do, they will make those decisions. But please remember, mask up, social distance, hand hygiene. Uh, those are behavioral norms that don't go away uh, regardless of vaccination. Sure. I want to thank the three of you, Emily and Anthony and Nina, for participating in today's session. And I'd like to just ask one more, ask one more question uh, before we turn it over to, to Amy and finish up. If we weren't able to get to all of the questions uh, that were asked. Is there a way for us to, for those questions that weren't answered, is there a way for those questions to get answered? And if so, what does it look like? No, my suggestion would be for us to gather the questions and to uh, we'll divvy them up amongst the, the panelists and identify um, others who can help in providing those answers. And then maybe uh, Amy can put them on a website or some kind of a, a post to let people know, know uh, where those answers can be found. We have a website for Michigan Medicine as well that I think addresses many of these same questions because we have regular town halls. Um, that's another uh, opportunity uh, to identify, so just go to Michigan Medicine related coronavirus and you'll be able to see an FAQ that will help you uh, now and in the future. Perfect. Amy? Yeah. Jade will put me back up on the screen. And I want to thank all of our presenters for being with us. Uh, Chuck, thank you so much for moderating. And it was great to have you with us from the County Health Department. And thanks to all of our presenters for sharing their expertise. And it's really great to have people have a chance to get their questions answered. And as you were just saying, we will um, collect the questions from the chat that were not answered and do our best to get answers for them and post them. We will be posting the recording of this talk on a web page um, on our museum website. It should be up sometime this week. And the link to that page is in the chat. One of our team is putting it up. Also, if you wanted to make a donation to support future fair and lectures, we're gonna put the link to the page where you can make donations as well. We'll be sending out a feedback form for you to give us feedback. Um, Zoom fair and, this is our first Zoom fair and lecture. So, you can tell us what you liked about it and tell us how we can do a better job next time. And we'll really appreciate your input on that. So thank you everyone for attending. I really appreciate you all being here today and uh, be safe out there. And I hope that as the vaccine rolls out, you'll all be able to be vaccinated and safe in the future. Thank you so much. <laughs>